to Empower In. My name is Caroline Porter Thomas. Thank you so much as usual for watching my YouTube channel. In this video, we're going to go over disease process that I have seen a lot in my years of nursing. And I'm sure that you will probably see it as well while you are in nursing school, potentially, and also while you are working as a nurse, and that is pulmonary embolism. This is a disease process that I've seen a lot of young people get, young and old, but it's always a little bit interesting when you do have young patients that are acutely ill. So this was a video that I really enjoyed doing because I really wanted to learn about the information myself. So my goal with this video and with all of my videos is to basically sum up the important facts that my team and I could find and put it in a very nice video for you so that you can learn it very quickly and easily. So I hope we did that and if you do think we did that then do me a favor and give the video a thumbs up. Alright guys without any further ado let's get started and let's go over pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism, which you will see abbreviated as PE, is a life-threatening disease that it involves the blockage of the main arteries of the lungs or any of its branches through a substance that may have reached the lungs through the bloodstream. A common reason for this type of blockage is a clot in the blood. A blood clot may be large or small in size, and there may be multiple clots. PE belongs to a group of problems that are together known as venous thromboembolism, which you will see abbreviated as VTE. Venous signifies relation to the veins. Thrombus means blockage of a blood vessel because of a blood clot or thrombus, and it becomes an embolism when a thrombus is detached from the site of its formation and travels with the blood flow to get stuck in the narrow blood vessels at any place in the body. The thrombus is then known as an embolism. Causes of pulmonary embolism. In the majority of causes, deep vein thrombosis, which you will see abbreviated as DVT, is the most common cause of an embolism. In a DVT, a blood clot or thrombus that has originated in the deep vein and has traveled in the blood circulation to get stuck in one of the blood vessels of the lung. This detached thrombus is known as an embolus and can lead to an embolism. Most of the DVTs originate from the veins in the legs or the pelvis. In rare cases, a PE may originate from a blood clot in the arm veins or from a thrombus originating from the heart. Three main influences increase the chance of a thrombus formation in a patient, and these are known as Virchow's triad. These include the following. Alteration in the flow of blood that may be caused due to lack of movement after immediate surgery, injury, or conditions such as pregnancy, obesity, or cancer. Also, factors in the vessel wall that may arise due to surgery or injury due to catheterization, known as endothelial injury. And the last one is factors that affect the blood coagulation factors, such as a procoagulant state. Some examples of this include estrogen-based hormonal contraceptives, or birth control, genetic thrombophilia, acquired thrombophilia, or cancer caused due to procoagulant secretion. Some of the other causes of pulmonary embolism include, in some rare cases, Cases, the blockage of the blood vessel in the lungs resulting from formation of emboli which are not caused by blood clots. It may be a fatty material of the marrow of a broken bone, such as in cases where a lung and large bone, such as thigh bone or femur is broken, a foreign body from an impure injection, such as with drug misuse, and amniotic fluid from childbirth or pregnancy. A large bubble of air in the vein could also cause it. A small piece of tumor, which may have broken off from a large tumor in the body, is also another potential cause. Signs and symptoms. Signs and symptoms of pulmonary embolisms. These symptoms are usually sudden in onset and may depend on the size of the clot. The present health status of an individual that is affected may also play some role 
In addition to how well the individual's lungs can manage the clot, small pulmonary embolisms may result in no symptoms at all, which could be common. But a symptom could be breathlessness that could vary from very mild to a high level, chest pain which may be pleuritic and may result from irritation caused by the blood clot on the pleura around the lungs, hemoptysis which means coughing up blood, a mild fever, and tachycardia. With a massive or multiple PEs, the signs and symptoms could be severe breathlessness, chest pain that may be felt in the center of the chest behind the breastbone, having a faint feeling, sinkable episode, or even collapse, and a large clot may interfere with the heart and the blood circulation, which may lead to a great reduction in blood pressure. Cardiac arrests in extreme cases can also occur, where the heart may be stopped pumping due to the clot. Indications of a DVT such as pain at the back of the leg calf, tenderness in the calf, muscle or swelling of the leg or foot may be present. The calf may turn warm and red. Diagnostic tests for pulmonary embolism. Multiple tests may be conducted in order to confirm the diagnosis. That may include a blood test which is called the D-dimer. This detects the fragments of breakdown products of a blood clot. The higher the fragment level, the more chances of a blood clot in the vein. But this test may be positive in many other cases as well, such as recent surgery or pregnancy. Therefore, this test does not necessarily diagnose a DVT or PE, but may indicate the likely probability of having a blood clot. It can help in deciding if future tests are needed. CT, pulmonary angiography, and ventilation perfusion scan, which is also called a VQ scan, these are specialized scans that monitor the circulation in the lungs and are useful as they can accurately indicate whether a PE is present or not. An ultrasound or Doppler. This test indicates the blood flow in the veins and any blockage of blood flow. In a case where a DVT is found, then a PE may be assumed as the cause of the symptoms. An electrocardiograph. This test may be useful for clients with a massive PE as it indicates large clots in the lungs and its impact on the heart. This test can be conducted at the bedside. However, it does not identify a small PE. An electrocardiogram or ECG can also be used, but the main use of the ECG is to eliminate any other causes in cases of chest pain. A chest x-ray, this test may be used to rule out pneumonia or other chest-related problems. Treatments for pulmonary embolism. Anticoagulant. Anticoagulant treatment is started immediately in usual course, as soon as a PE is suspected, in order to avoid the worsening of the clot. While the tests are still confirmed, the medication for anticoagulation is in two key forms, injection and tablets. Syrups are available for those who cannot swallow tablets. The injectable form includes heparin or low molecular weight heparins, which you will see abbreviated as LMWH. Low molecular weight heparins or fondaparinex are administered in the initial stages as they work instantaneously. Once the injection start working and the diagnosis is confirmed, the tablets can be started. Warfarin or Coumadin is the most popular medication used. It needs, however, a few days in order to be fully effective. Anticoagulation treatment is continued for nearly three months after a PE in the majority of cases. However, a long-term treatment may be advised if further risk of the embolism is suspected. Thrombolysis. Thrombolysis is an enzymatic destruction of the clot, which takes place with help of medication. A clot dissolving injection is given to a client in order to facilitate the dissolving of the blood clot. Altaplace is the usual medication, with streptokinase or urokinase as the main alternatives. This treatment is more effective than anticoagulation treatment with heparin or warfarin. However, it has a higher risk of side effects, such as unwanted bleeding and bleeding into the brain in worst cases. Inferior vena cava filter, which you will also see as an IVC filter. This is in cases where anticoagulation therapy is contraindicated. For example, in patients where there has been a major operation, a 
An inferior vein cava filter may be implanted in order to filter emboli from entering the pulmonary artery and thus not allowing them to combine with the existing blockage. However, if possible, the filter should be removed when it is safe to use anticoagulation therapy. Embolectomy. Embolectomy is a major surgery where the embolus is removed. It needs a specialty hospital and trained surgical team and is usually the last option for the extremely ill client because the surgery has a high risk of mortality. However, it may be an option when a client has a massive PE, which in itself has a high risk of mortality if not treated. Catheter embolectomy or catheter fragmentation of the clot involves threading of a catheter through the blood vessel till it reaches the blood clot in the lung. Once the clot is accessed, it is possible to remove it or break it using treatment through the tube. Treatments during pregnancy and postnatal period. A higher risk of PE exists at any phase of pregnancy till the completion of six weeks postnatal. Any manifestations of DVT or PE in a pregnant or postnatal woman need to be examined quickly. The treatment for PE in pregnancy is done with help of heparin injections and not warfarin since warfarin has the risk of causing birth defects in the fetus. The treatment in pregnancy is continued till three months after the embolism or for six weeks postnatally, whichever one may be longer. Postnatally, warfarin, if necessary, can be given instead of heparin once bleeding from the birth has settled. Prevention tips for pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolisms can be prevented in individuals with risk factors. For example, clients admitted to the hospital may be administered preventative medication and antithrombosis treatment in order to reduce the risk of PE. The Joint Commission has designed core measures that most hospitals follow today to create better outcomes for the hospitalized patients by using evidence-based practices. Hospitals are held accountable to these core measures and overall patient outcomes have improved remarkably. All right guys, I really hope you enjoyed that video. I really hope to help you out a lot either on the job or nursing school. If it did help you out in any way and you would like to see more videos like this, please again do me a favor and give the video a thumbs up. And if you don't mind, post a comment letting me know if you liked it, what you liked, what you didn't like, how we can improve, or how I can improve the videos. So anyways, as usual, thank you so much for watching my channel and I love you guys so much. Oh yeah, also make sure you stay tuned because in the next few days we're going to go over nursing exam or NCLEX style questions in video format. But if you would also like to take Take a quiz going over this disease process you can click right here or on the link below in the description section wherever I decide to put it so anyways I hope all of this helps you out a ton and it's always my pleasure to be there for you guys and I cannot wait to see you in my next video I love you so much bye